Hello, my name is Michael Papp. I'm with the Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology Program at the Department of Rehabilitation Services. And I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the rehab engineering process and go over some design projects that we have. So the Department of Rehabilitation Services um, has a comprehensive assistive technology program. We provide assistive technology and engineering services to both children and adults with disabilities throughout the state of Alabama. We serve people with a wide range of different types of disabilities, including physical, learning, blind listening or vision, hearing impairments, um, people with developmental disabilities and traumatic brain injuries. Um, that's not all inclusive. There's a lot of other different types of disabilities we work with as well. Our program provides a variety of different services to help people with disabilities find technology that's going to help them overcome the challenges that they're facing. And so we provide evaluations and recommendations for technology and accommodations uh, set up for that, uh, also including building, creating, modifying equipment. We provide training, uh, custom design and fabrication as needed, and of course, technical support. And so what the accommodation process looks like is a modified version of your standard engineering process where we will take a look at the needs and abilities of the individual. We will then determine what the desired outcomes are, what we want them to be able to do. Then we start looking at the features of different solutions that might work for them. Does it need to work inside, outside? in light, dark, is it electronic or, or mechanical? Um, then we determine what intervention we're going to utilize, what technology we're gonna put in place and training. And then we follow up and get feedback on how that is working for them. So the model that we're using for determining what uh, accommodations are gonna be used is commonly known as the HAT model for assistive technology services is we take a look at the human, um, the activity or task that they need to perform, the technology that's in place for that person. And those three things form a, a kind of a centralized model. And then we also evaluate the environment or the context in which they need to operate. And so in terms of having a system, the human, the activity and the technology that they're using is the system. And so when we're meeting with an individual to try and figure out what their needs are, is that we want to find the specific characteristics of a person. What are their abilities, whether uh, physical, sensory, and cognitive. For people with disabilities, we specifically want to know what their functional limitations are and identify what they're having difficulty doing. Uh, we would like to gather anthropometric data, which is the measurement of human beings it might be how tall they are, how much they weigh, how far they can reach, um, how low they can reach, how high they can reach, stuff like that would be anthropometric data. Um, and then we also want to evaluate their skills and knowledge to make sure that whatever intervention we decide to use matches with their current knowledge and skills or that they, we think that they can be trained um, to be able to use the equipment. Uh, the second part is the task or the activity that they need to perform. And so during this part of the assessment, we'll break down what are the essential components of the assessment, um, determining what the different steps are involved in performing whatever the task is. We want to look at how the task is typically performed. So if you think of someone on an assembly line, there's a specific way that they have been trained to perform that task. Then we start looking at alternative ways that person can perform whatever the task is. So if it's something where they're having difficulty putting a washer on a bolt, for example, we might start looking for alternative ways for them to be able to perform that task. Uh, finally is the environment or the context in which they need to be able to work. So that person with the activity and the technology that we're using, 
we want to know where the environment is going to be. So some of the major issues, are they going to be inside or outside? Um, is it bright or, or dark? Um, do we have issues like vibration, excessive heat, excessive moisture? Um, maybe going from a cold to a warm environment where you might have issues with condensation in an electronic device. We want to take a look at all these different environmental considerations when we're working on designing a system for somebody, uh, whether we're buying off the shelf components and assembling them or designing something from scratch. Um, and the final part of the system is the technology that they're going to be using. And so we would like to know what technology is currently being used to perform a specific task. Um, and also what other types of technology might be available to perform that task. It's always easier to purchase something off the shelf if we can find something, um, whether it works as is, can be used in a slightly different way than was designed to be used or modified uh, for someone to operate. And so we're gonna take a look at the characteristics of the technology. A big one is if it's electronic, what are the power requirements? How long does it need to operate? If it, does, if it can't be plugged in, issues like that. Um, high versus low tech is another common thing that we want to consider. A large percentage of people are technophobic, uh, which means that they don't really like to use technology that they're not familiar with. They don't really want to learn how to use new things or change how they're doing things. And uh, so we want to take a look at what their comfort level is with different types of technology. So for our typical evaluation process as rehabilitation engineers, we want to meet with the stakeholders, which would include the person with a disability. If we're doing job accommodations, it might be a supervisor or a coworker um, or other rehab staff. If it might be a child or teachers, if they are a student in school or a teacher's aide, uh, to identify what the abilities and the functional limitations are of the person. Uh, so that we can actually start to list out the different activities that the person needs to be able to perform and what the components of those activities might be. So if you imagine someone who might work in a mail room, it might involve them getting the mail from the post office, taking it into the mail room in a basket, putting it on a table, sorting the mail, delivering the mail to different mailboxes, or maybe delivering it to different floors, putting it back in a cart. So we would want to identify all those different components of that task. If possible, we would like to observe the task that needs to be performed um, actually being done, uh, either by the person with a disability or by someone else who's knowledgeable about that task so that we can actually evaluate and see what's involved with it. Um, during the evaluation, we take a look at the environment, as I already discussed, the window dimensions, light, heat, vibration, um, electromagnetic interference is something else that comes up, especially for things that use uh, FM systems for people with hearing impairment. And then we will discuss as part of our evaluation process, ideas for solutions um, that the person might have had or that a coworker or supervisor or teacher or caregiver, someone else who has been involved with the individual with a disability. Um, and so that we kind of have an idea of maybe what they're thinking um, and identify some specific preferences that they might have. And then also educate them on their choices if we're aware of technology that might work or might fill it in uh, whatever the gaps are that we're looking at and let them know, um, give them the opportunity to comment, look at it, um, maybe if we can have the device physically have them try it out. So at the, after the evaluation, we uh, will produce a report and which may include designs if it's a custom device. And as part of this report, the first thing we really want to do is list out the characteristics of the person, the activity that they're being that they're performing, and important information about the environment that we need to consider as part of developing our system or building or designing a new device. And so what we're really looking for is to identify what the physical or cognitive abilities are of the person 
and what the physical or cognitive or sensory abilities are necessary to perform that task and we're looking at what that gap is and so we're trying to determine a design for a system or a new product or whatever that's going to fill that gap for that individual so we're trying to take what their abilities are and we're trying to use technology to increase their abilities to get it closer to what the requirements are of the task so the first thing we start to do once we know what we need to fill that what that gap is is look for available technologies to see if they will partially or fully fill the gap. And so when I talk about designing a system, um, an assistive technology system for the person, it is looking for the technology that is going to be able to fill that gap in. Um, and that of course is the quickest thing is if we can find an off the shelf component or components to be able to assemble a system for the person. Um, if we don't have anything or a good idea uh, we'll start brainstorming for ideas, looking for technologies or ideas for designs to bridge the gap between the person's ability and the functional requirements of the job. Um, once we have a system in place, one of the most important things to provide is training. Um, some of the technology we recommend for people and some of the stuff we develop is pretty self-evident, pretty simple to use like a weighted pen for someone who has tremors. Um, it just works the way it works. It doesn't really require a lot of training for someone to use, but some other technologies that we're utilizing um, can be very difficult and very frustrating to use, say like a voice recognition system to control a computer uh, or an eye gaze computer control system um, or using Amazon Echo on our Alexa system to operate and find information in a convergent database, for example. Those are things that would require quite a bit of training for the individual to get used to. And without training, it ends up being a plane wreck. So we have to really make sure that when we're figuring out what the system is that a person's going to use or what the design is that a person needs, that we take into account whatever training is going to need to happen and we make sure that there's documentation in place for training or some sort of training is provided as part of providing the accommodation for the person with a disability. So some quick examples of past designs and past projects that we have had um, that were not entirely off the shelf. Um, the first one is an adapted sewing machine. Uh, the gentleman who this was made for uh, was in a car automobile accident. He had worked in an upholstery shop doing car automotive upholstery. And uh, in his accident, he had a spinal cord injury that was, I think, maybe C6, C7, which is the lower part of his neck. It did affect, of course, he, did, he was not able to use his legs at all. He did not have any trunk support in, this, in his central trunk. Um, he had limited use of his hands. He was able to move his hands around, but he didn't have a very fine um, grip with his fingers to manipulate things. And so he wanted to be able to continue uh, in the job that he was doing and in, in doing upholstery for vehicles. Most sewing machines, um, their primary controls are all operated with your feet. And so uh, a standard industrial sewing machine will have a treadle control to operate the speed of the machine. Um, for an industrial sewing machine, they usually have a clutch instead of an electronic control, at least the ones we've worked with. Um, so it's more like operating a clutch on a car uh, than just pressing down a, a foot pedal that's electronic. Um, the industrial sewing machines will also have a knee control that will lift the foot. The foot is what holds the fabric down. But when you're sewing with both hands, you don't want to take the time to reach back behind the machine to flip a lever up. So there will be a knee control, a paddle that you press to the side with your knee that will lift the foot so you can use both of your hands to reposition. Um, whatever it is you're stitching. And so both of those things need to be modified so that he could use it. And we were able to make some um, elbow switches, which are kind of the black 
levers that are attached to the front of the machine that you see coming off. Um, so we were able to make some some modifications to the way the machine operated so that in using instead of having a foot control and knee control there were some black levers located where he could very easily use his elbow to push down on the lever in order to control the speed and then move his elbow over a little when he was when he was moving the the uh, fabric around he could move his elbow over a little bit and press down with that to lift the foot up uh, so that worked pretty well for him uh, another example um, of something we have, this is actually a video, is a uh, packing tape jig. Um, this was for an individual who had a vision impairment and had uh, some dexterity and coordination issues. And his job was to pack boxes and then tape them up for shipment. And he was having a lot of difficulty coordinating, moving the box, holding the box with one hand and taping with a packing tape gun because oftentimes that, that requires one hand to be doing something and moving in a different direction than the other hand. And so that was an issue for him. Um, he was having difficulty with it. And so this, this fixture, uh, this jig that we came up with um, for him, basically mounted the packing tape gun to a ta table so that he didn't have to worry about manipulating that with his hand and it had a movable fence on it, as you can see, so that it could be sized for different size boxes. And so all he had to do is move the fence to the right size. And he could use both hands in concert doing the same thing to wrap tape around the box. And in the end, it was a very nice and neat solution for him. Um, every box came out perfect instead of having a, a very messy taping job. We also do a lot of stuff with home modifications and independent living. Um, we do a lot of ramp repair, having to go back in and rebuild ramps um, that aren't built properly. They're falling over. They don't have proper cross bracing or diagonal bracing, or they're too steep, uh, more like a ski jump, um, like the one on the lower left-hand corner. Um, and so we do go back in and we do make modifications. We, we do build ramps from scratch, but we also do a lot of ramp repairs and uh, modifications for that and we do a lot of other things uh, develop a lot of other technologies or modify uh, items so that someone can live independently so someone with a very significant disability that might be homebound um, we've developed different types of uh, drinking uh, devices so that someone can leave uh, a caregiver can leave a, um, a large insulated container with some water or, or juice or whatever in it, home with somebody who might need to be at home for a couple hours and is not able to really get water or drink by themselves. Um, we've made different types of mechanisms like with extended straws that can be positioned so that they, they, they are able to get what they need. And so here's another example of a device we developed. It's a one-handed rubber band jig, um, and this is something where we had had a person who was an accountant uh, who had had a stroke and she had lost the ability to use one of her hands. And the place where she worked, uh, their, pro their process was that when an invoice had been paid for the month, they had rubber banded all the invoices together into a stack to file them. Um, that's the process that they wanted to use. And she wasn't able to do that with one hand. Putting a, a rubber band around a stack of papers is pretty difficult. And so we were able to come up with a pretty simple little fixture uh, that would enable her to put the rubber band around the paperwork all with one hand. And of course, it doubled as a document holder for her as well. So she could have it right next to her um, computer as she was entering the invoices into the system. She could just slide it in. Um, and when she was done, she just flipped the rubber bands off the little sticks and, and it all held together. We do a lot of customized desks and workstations for people with different types of disabilities. Um, and this particular photo is a extremely high desk. I think it maybe has 42 inches of clearance underneath it. It looks like a standing desk, but it was built for someone who had very high level quadriplegia and used a head array, head controlled wheelchair. Um, and people with that level of spinal cord injury 
typically have very large chairs and the, one of the things the chair needs to do is it needs to be able to do pressure relief to get um, pressure off of their their hips so that they don't get pressure sores if they're sitting all day and so every 30 minutes or so they need to tilt the chair all the way back so that their back is bearing the pressure the weight of their body instead of their their hips um, and so for someone to be able to do that, they need to have a very high desk. Uh, so we have built and designed custom desks um, for someone who needs to do it that, who needs something that high. And also a lot of those individuals who use mouth sticks, um, if they need to flip pages in a book or if they need to manipulate something, they'll have a stick that they grip in their teeth um, and they use it to flip pages or, or um, they can paint or, or write or do whatever they wanna do. Um, with it, but you need to have a very high desk. It needs to be kind of up at chin level um, or your upper chest level in order to do that. Um, I think this is the last example of something we had developed was a, a customized measuring tape. And this was developed for a nurse who had to very precisely uh, pres uh, position EKG or EMG, I guess it would be EMG uh, pads they had to be measured and know exactly how far apart they had to be and uh, and it had to be in the metric system not in the US system and in the United States there really aren't any low vision measuring devices that are in metric uh, at least not one that would work for her and so we custom designed a low vision tape measuring system with a sliding guide on it so she could slide the guide to exactly where it needed to be um, and there was different colors depending on, on, on what the measurement was and everything. But so, so this was something we were able to create for her custom tape measure. And then we 3D printed the slide. And this is the first thing we actually 3D printed with our printer many years ago. And so now I wanted to take the time to go over some possible project design ideas. And we are always designing little things but our feel, our, the time frame that we have to design something might be a few weeks to maybe a month or so. When we have a request come in, we don't have a lot of time to be able to develop something and get it out the door because we'll have multiple cases at the same time. And typically, especially for someone who's trying to go to work, the time frame is pretty tight on how long we have to actually work on a project. And so when I have a project that I think is something that could be designed if we had enough time, and it's something that I might have had a request every year or so for, I'll put it up on a project board. Um, and that project board is the source of the projects I'm about to, to show to you. Um, there are also projects I think would be a good team project. Uh, some of them are simpler, some of them are pretty complex. Uh, so there's kind of a wide range of different things that might be able to work for you guys. Um, and so the first one is a desk lifter. Now, I know a lot of people have seen the standing desks uh, that are available, either electronic, a full desk, or a little thing that sits on the top of a desk. Uh, but what we're actually looking for is to help um, we don't feel that either of those products really fully meet the needs of people who need to be able to work from a sitting and standing position because it just adjusts the, the, the position of a computer really. It doesn't move file any files or drawers that might be uh, needed that someone might need to access if, there's, if they go from sitting to standing. Um, and so what we're looking for is a mechanism that would fit up under a standard office desk like this one um, that would be a lift that would be able to lift that entire desk from a sitting to standing position so that if someone has a job where they have a lot of uh, paperwork or other things that have to be secured in a desktop if they go from sitting to standing they're still able to reach whatever they're trying to get to without having to bend over these are mostly people with back injuries and we're trying to reduce bending so we like to alternate depending on the back injury, we like to go from sitting to standing and back to sitting periodically, maybe a couple times a day, 
to help relieve pressure um, and to change positions for the person so that they're not maintaining a static posture all day. But if we go to a standing position, we want to make sure that they don't have to bend over. So we're looking for something that would fit up underneath the desk that they could hit a foot pedal or a button or something and have it raise up fairly quickly into a standing position and then lower back down quickly when they need to. So these are two examples of standing desks and, and we do use these a little bit. They're not optimal, um, but they somewhat get the job done. But I think, we, I think there could be a better design out there, um, especially for people who have a lot of stuff and files that they need to be able to access. Okay, so the next item is something that I've had come up periodically is that for someone with complete paralysis, they have difficulty pressing the power buttons on computers. Um, these could be desktops or laptops. And there's a couple systems that can be integrated with environmental control and other, other things like that. But we're really looking for a standalone mechanism that can be attached to a computer, whether it's a laptop or desktop, that will be able to actuate the power button for somebody. Um, and so there's, on the surface, it doesn't sound like a very complex problem, but if you want something that will go on a laptop and be able to turn it on and off, you don't have a lot of space to work with there. Um, so there's some ideas as to how it can be done, um, but we just really haven't had time to develop something like that. And so the next one is a fairly complicated um, situation. And so for someone, I'll show you a real quick, with, this is a tilt in space power wheelchair um, with a rehab seating system. This is for someone with a very high level disability that requires a lot of support. Um, and the chair has a lot, it has a lot of different adjustments, but it can tilt back and forth, forward and backwards. And I had mentioned someone with high level quadriplegia before. Um, this chair can tilt all the way back so that the person's weight is, is resting all the way on their back. Uh, and not really on their hips so they can do pressure relief. For some people with significant disabilities, when they're going down a ramp um, because of arm weakness, they'll tilt, they'll go down the ramp a little bit and they'll tilt, they'll stop and tilt the chair back a little bit and then go down a little further and then stop and tilt it back a little more and they'll go a little further and then stop and tilt it back a little more so that their hand will stay on the joystick because they have extreme muscle weakness, they have difficulty keeping their hands on the joystick. So that kind of works for going up and down ramps. But for someone who has a really severe disability, who is having that issue with keeping their hand on that joystick, um, the side to side tilt can be an issue uh, and is an issue. And I've known people who have been going through their yards and the, their arm will kind of fall over to the side on the joystick and then the chair will just start doing circles. They get stuck like that because they don't have the strength to lift their hand back up. And so if they're on a nice flat level surface, they don't really have an issue with operating their chair. But when they get on an unlevel surface, especially with complex contours or a cross slope, uh, which is a slope um, perpendicular to your direction of travel instead of parallel with your direction of travel, they have difficulty being able to control their chairs. And so the idea behind this is to have a some sort of mechanism that inserts between uh, the seating system and the base, kind of like this tilt in space does, um, but will tilt in all directions so that no matter what surface that they're on, it will keep the chair level and it'll do it automatically. So imagine the example I gave someone going down a ramp, instead of them having to constantly stop, switch modes and then tilt it back a little bit, if they go down the ramp um, and they have this feature turned on, the chair will just automatically adjust itself to keep them at the same level to gravity that they typically are at for operating their chair. And if they're going across the yard, they might be going downhill and, uh, and across a cross slope. So you might have a complicated sort of situation. And if they're going like this, it'll keep that seat flat compared to the, to, um, the surface that they're on. Uh, and so this is a pretty complicated problem. We've come up with some ideas that might be able to do it mechanically. Um, electronics is probably the way it would go. Uh, but at any rate, that's another project. Uh, 
Next project, Voice Amplifier for Dragon Naturally Speaking. Dragon Naturally Speaking is a program for Windows. It's been out for a very long time, and it is a speech recognition program that allows anybody to fully control a computer hands-free. And it's fairly inexpensive. It's maybe about $150 at this time. It works really well for people who have good voice uh, support, have a, have a loud enough voice. But for somebody, especially with a disability that's progressive, like multiple sclerosis, who might have issues as their voice gets softer, um, in a lot of disabilities, people will have their voice volume decrease throughout the day. And MS is another example of that, where in the morning, their voice may be strong, the afternoon, not so much, especially if you're using it for operating a computer. Um, the standard amplification that's available built into a computer system really isn't sufficient for them. And so they're there's ways to get big old amplifiers plugged into a professional microphone system to provide amplification. It's not really a practical solution for most people, especially if they need something that's portable. And so what this project is looking at is a way to build a microphone that will have more advanced amplification built into it so that someone's voice is loud enough to operate Dragon Naturally Speaking. Now, I know that there's other ways for people with severe disabilities to operate computer systems like eye gaze or, um, or custom mouth joysticks. Those systems start around two to $3,000 and move on up. I think eye gaze is maybe around $6,000 versus $150 uh, for Dragon. And Dragon actually gives you faster and better control than those other systems do. So you can kind of see why looking for a solution for someone who has poor voice control or poor breath support, um, like someone who's recently had a laryngectomy or someone with a recent spinal cord injury, a lot of times those folks have had a, um, have had a tracheotomy, um, which has affected their ability to speak uh, with a loud voice, um, especially if they had stuff, a, a big stoma or something going on. Um, and so we, we are looking for a solution uh, that will help with Dragon. The next item, it's another portable voice amplifier, but it's for a different uh, need. So for a lot of people who have low voice volume, uh, we'll use a voice amplifier. And these are little packs or little boxes that have a he big headset microphone um, plugged into a battery powered amplifier and it has a fairly low quick quality amplification, but it just, it, it'll amplify someone's voice by 20 or 30 decibels so that you can hear it. But the problem with this particular item for some of our folks is that the pitch of their voice um, due to disability may be extremely high or extremely low to the point that it's very hard to understand what they are saying because their pitch is outside the range of normal speech. And so one that is, I've seen a couple times is people with a condition called dysphonia, which is where the, mu the muscles supporting the vocal cords are extremely tight. And so the person's voice is very high pitched, like they've been breathing helium, very high. Um, it's very hard to hear them on the phone because the telephone will do it will, frequency clipping um, that's part of the phone system will actually clip off most of this audio because it, cu it cuts the audio back to a much smaller range than normal speech. This is why people sound different on the phone than they do in person. Um, but they can also be very difficult to understand in loud environments, uh, such as a restaurant, industrial environment. Um, one young lady wanted to be an ER nurse. In, a, in the ER, one of the issues we had for her was the uh, pitch and the noise of all the, the alarms and stuff that can beep in an ER was kind of at the same pitch as her voice. And so you could not hear her. Um, and so her voice was very high pitched. It was soft and you couldn't hear it. So we were looking for a voice amplification system that not only would amplify her voice, but would also drop the pitch down um, into a normal human range 
while keeping it at her voice. We're just looking at shifting her voice. Um, we did look at um, those voice changers that you can buy at the spy store or something like that that completely change your voice. And that just that wasn't appropriate because uh, it wasn't her voice and it sounded too weird. Um, so we're really just looking for a, a wearable device similar to the standard voice amplifier that has an extra knob on it that you can turn um, that will allow someone to adjust their pitch down into a more average range. And then also part of the request was something that would help them uh, use a phone a little bit better because that's another big issue. If your voice pitch is too high or too low, the uh, frequency clipping on the phone makes it hard for someone to use a telephone. Uh, the next item, hearing aid audiogram sound filter. And so when someone has a hearing test, they'll go to an audiologist, and most of you have probably been through this. You've had a set of headphones on, and you'll hear a tone in one ear, and you raise that hand. You hear a tone in the other ear, you raise that hand, and the tones are all at different pitches. And what the audiologist is doing is testing the frequency response of your ear at different frequency ranges and different decibel levels. And when they're done with that, they will be able to produce what's called an audiogram. And, that audio, and there's some examples of audiograms here. This happens to be someone with, looks like hearing loss in their left ear. Um, that outlines what the frequency response is for somebody. And so that's actually what they can hear. Uh, that, that's what they're hearing frequency wise. Unfortunately, this diagram doesn't really mean much to loved ones or employers or anybody else. Um, and so what we're looking for is a really simple uh, sound filter uh, for the audiogram. And the request is to develop a device or app that someone who has hearing loss can use to input the results of their audiogram. So like at the different frequencies or different frequency ranges, kind of what their hearing level is. And so that they can play um, an audio file, like a piece of music or the sound of a phone ringing or a TV show or whatever, some sort of audio recording through that filter so that family members, employers, kids, teachers, whoever has the opportunity to experience firsthand what that person's hearing actually is like. Because some, we run into a lot of issues where an employer or a spouse will say, well, I don't understand why you can't hear the doorbell ring when he can hear the football game or I don't understand why this person can't hear certain things at work or certain hear they have difficulty hearing understanding certain person talking at work they can hear this person they can't hear that person um, and so that can cause a lot of conflict and issues for folks with hearing impairment and so the idea behind this is to develop uh, a way for them to be able to show anyone who needs to know what they can hear, give them an example or give them examples, um, and hopefully build a little bit of empathy, um, both from employers and, and uh, for people going to school with teachers and professors uh, and with family members, of course, and friends and family. Okay, hearing aid battery loader. And so um, many people with hearing loss are older and they, depending on how they lost their hearing, say they have diabetes, um, may also have some physical impairments and have difficulty loading batteries into hearing aids. And so this project is looking for a way to load uh, batteries into a hearing aid a little bit more easily. And so here's an example from one particular hearing aid manufacturer of how the battery uh, is loaded. And so the battery is directional. It has to go in the right way. Um, it has a very small slot that has, has to be flipped open, kind of a thumbnail slot, and you slide the battery in the correct way, and then you have to close it. And so some folks are having, have difficulty with this, older individuals. And so this project is looking at ways to be able to improve this um, process for those individuals who use hearing aids that, that are not rechargeable, that do have batteries. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, there are hearing aids that are rechargeable, um, 
but the lower, the less expensive ones, and by less expensive, I mean the ones that are like two to three thousand uh, dollars, typically use a, use a separate battery. Um, the ones that have batteries are much, much more expensive, and insurance really doesn't cover that. Um, and so, usually, when someone buys hearing aids, they're going to get the less expensive ones that need batteries, and those typically need to be changed every week or so. Okay, this came from our deaf services um, staff members uh, who, one of the systems that we use uh, for people who have lost their hearing, uh, so they, they are hearing, they can speak fine, uh, but they've lost their hearing typically as an adult. Um, in order to use a phone, they can still talk on a standard phone, but they can't hear very well. Even with hearing aids, they'll use something called CapTel, which, um, caption telephone, uh, where they will be talking to somebody on the other end, and the person on the other end is talking back to them, but there's an operator, a re it's called a relay service. This is a, a federal program that's free for people, but the relay operator will actually um, caption what the person is saying. Um, and And so the person with the hearing impairment can read what is being said by the person on the other end of the phone. One of the, one of the problems we keep running into um, with the CapTel phones is they are designed and they work very well with analog systems, um, but we do have difficulty using them on voice over IP systems. They can be very complex to set up. Um, you still have to have an analog line in there someplace, which isn't always very effective. And so on the PBX and voice over IP telephone systems, um, using a CapTel phone can, can be very difficult. And so there are some little workarounds that we try and do, but they're not as effective as just using a straight up CapTel phone. And so the request from our deaf services is to develop a reasonable, reasonably simple, reasonably not uncomplex way of being able to provide a CapTel phone to an individual with a hearing impairment who is on a PBX or voice over IP uh, phone system. Next one, floor transfer device. And so this came uh, to me from one of my friends uh, who uh, I work with. He's a coworker as well, um, but he uses a wheelchair for mobility and he likes to be able to work in his workshop and get down and be able to do stuff. But getting on and off the floor is very difficult. He also likes to travel. And um, they do make patient lifts, uh, it's called a Hoyer lift. So a, a traditional pa patient lift is basically like a big boom crane. Um, it's a patient, it's a, it's a, like an engine lift. It's just rated for lifting people. It's a fairly large object, takes up a lot of space. Um, is kind of unwieldy, and it's not the sort of thing that an individual can use by themselves. Someone has to transform them. And so what, what this request is for is to completely rethink the way patient lifts work so that someone um, who is using a wheelchair, uh, someone who might be a, like, say, a paraplegic, has a lift that they can operate themselves. It doesn't have to be this big boom lift. And it's something especially that can help them get on and off the floor. Um, if they wanna get on the floor, say work on the car, or they wanna paint something, or um, they need to get up under the sink to, to, uh, to uh, fix something, um, getting on and off the floor from a wheelchair is very difficult, and getting, especially getting back into the chair. And so this request is for some sort of mechanism and on, on the right side of this, I have something called an adjustable creeper. Um, it's not powered or anything. It's something that um, a mechanic might use. And they just kind of, they stand up, they lift the thing into position. And um, they can set back down on it. They can get up underneath a truck or I think this one was for airplane mechanics or something. But what he's looking for is something that might be more along the lines of the adjustable creeper that would let him get up and down more easily without having to have a big patient left and someone else to help him. So it should be something that will let someone get from a wheelchair onto the floor 
and from the floor back up into the wheelchair without putting too much strain on their arms and something that they can do independently. And so the creeper is just uh, visualization, a suggestion, but we're looking at a way of redesigning a traditional patient lift so that it's easier, simpler to use. And the other request is that it be something that can be transported and used for traveling because carrying a big patient lift, say when you're driving cross country and staying in different hotels is not really a practical thing. Um, power wheelchair training device. Okay, so this was a request that comes from our children's program and children with very severe disabilities usually rely on caregivers to move them around. If they can't push themselves in a manual chair, someone has to push them around. And one of the drawbacks with this is that a significant part of early childhood brain development involves being able to move yourself around an environment and improves cognitive and spatial skills. Um, it just makes you more aware of what's safe and what's not safe. And so there's a push by therapists to try and get kids into power wheelchairs as soon as they possibly can. Um, but in order for an insurance company or Medicaid to pay for a wheelchair, the therapists need to be able to show that the child can safely operate a power wheelchair. And kind of like a car, it takes practice. Um, these uh, power wheelchairs are, are pretty expensive. It can be twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Well, maybe fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for a child's wheelchair. Um, but this is a big, heavy machine. It's got batteries. It's got powerful motors, and an inexperienced operator can hurt themselves with it. And so, um, it's not a good idea just to plop a uh, two or three year old child into a wheelchair and just send them on their way because they can hurt themselves, they could hurt somebody else, um, even with the speed turned down and the torque turned down on the motor and all that stuff. So uh, what, what this request is, is, is to create uh, a trainer of some sort that kids can get into. Um, now this child in this picture here uh, in, a, in a power wheelchair has a custom designed seating system uh, to support her. And so kids with very significant uh, disabilities, whatever, whether they're in a manual push chair or, or an adaptive stroller, there's these um, complex, they're medical strollers, essentially. It's not what you go and buy it at uh, the uh, baby equipment store at Walmart or whatever. Um, they're very complex, they have very complicated seating, they have different straps and, and lateral thigh supports and all this other stuff that the child needs to be able to be supported properly. And so we would be looking for a mechanism that you could take the child's existing seating system, maybe it might be a small push wheelchair to set on and have them be able to access a controller um, that they can practice in a therapeutic environment, a safe environment to learn how to drive a chair, to learn how they can operate it, and for the therapist to be able to observe them and teach them how to operate a chair safely. Um, and so uh, this is a question, this is something we get a request for every couple of years. Uh, we just really haven't had time to develop anything for that. Um, but that would be a really good project as well. And so I believe, oh, okay, we have another <laughs> another project, vibrating pen. And so for, um, we do work a lot of, with people who have tremors, essential tremors and Parkinson's disease. And there's been some research that have shown that vibration helps people with essential tremor or Parkinson's write more clearly. Um, it also helps them with spoons and forks and knives to be able to feed themselves and painting and other utensils that require fine motor movement. For some reason, the vibration, um, if they're holding something that vibrates, um, whether it's a glove on the back of their hand, we've tried experimenting around, we've tried to make vibrating gloves and little vibrating handles. Um, but those sorts of items, we found that if there's some sort of vibration, especially that they have to hold on to, um, it does help with penmanship and it helps with control. Um, there's some sort of feedback going on 
between uh, it's some sort of motor feedback. We, we, I don't know how it works and I haven't seen any studies that explain it yet, but we have seen um, anecdotally in the field when we have given someone a vibrating implement um, to be able to write with or, or perform a fine motor task, their, their uh, ability to do so is pretty significantly improved. And so here's some writing examples typical of people with uh, different types of um, tremors. Um, and so you can see someone trying to sign their signature and that's just an essential tremor. Another common problem is something called micrographia where the handwriting is very, very, very tiny. Um, I haven't seen a study explaining why that is. I suspect that they have to, they're trying to really stabilize their hand on whatever they're on the page. And I think when you do that, you don't have a lot of movement uh, available to be able to write. So you end up with really tiny handwriting. Um, and so what we're looking for is a mechanism that is a vibrating pen um, and that would have replaceable uh, ink cartridges uh, and something that would be rechargeable and easy to use. And again, with the rechargeable aspect, um, trying to plug in something like a micro USB for someone who has a hand tremor is is kind of a nightmare. <laughs> so uh, the rechargeability feature needs to be something that would be pretty easy, whether it's a magnetic cable or inductive or, or something that would be just a lot easier uh, for someone who has difficulty with hand tremors to be able to operate. Um, and, so, and so that is it. All right. And so I hope um, these projects have given you the opportunity to see some of the types of things that we get to see in the field as rehab engineers. Uh, I hope that what I let you know about uh, rehab engineering, kind of what our process is real quick, um, it was very helpful for you. In the process of designing stuff, as rehab engineers, because we are very hands-on with what we do, anything we design, we have to be able to make. And so when I talked about some of the factors like environmental factors that you need to consider uh, when you're developing a new product, you also need to take a look at what tools you have available to you and what your skill level is in order to operate them. And so, um, especially with our newer staff, I do recommend that you try and stretch a little bit. So if you've kind of used a saw before, and but I've never made dados, for example. Um, you know, certainly you, you can use that in a project and just kind of learn how to do that. But if you've never welded before, don't design some massive frame that needs to be welded. If you don't have access to, um, to welding equipment and someone who can help you with that. So I think, especially for rehab engineers, we have to be very careful with uh, making sure that our designs are something that we have the capacity to complete um, ourselves. If anybody has any questions about any of this, any of the design projects I presented, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I believe your teacher has my contact information. I'm happy to clarify anything or brainstorm on anything, um, provide any sort of feedback. Some of the projects I do have that are more recent uh, requests. I do have people who are, would be happy to provide